So on the way here in the car this morning, I noticed that there was a subway stop called Clinicus. And I was wondering where the Clinicus were because I, all I could see was a cemetery, a very big cemetery. So I guess what this actually proves is the old saying is right, that if medicine doesn't cure you, it kills you. And right there's the cemetery. I think the food system that we have today is very similar, but different in a fundamental way. It feeds us, it nourishes some, but it's killing the planet. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to take a step back from what we've been looking at and look at the food system at a planetary level. The aroma of Ethiopia have a saying, you can't wake a person who's pretending to sleep. We need to wake up to the fact that food production has the largest impact of any human activity on the planet. It's been responsible for 70% of biodiversity loss, 70% of habitat conversion, chemicals, water use, etc. And here's the challenge. In the next 40 years, we have to produce as much food as we have in the last 8,000. We're already living beyond the limits of the planet. Renewable resources are not renewing themselves as fast as we use them. We use about 70% of the planet to produce food today. If you take in mountains, lakes, rivers, streams, deserts, cities, protected areas, we're up to 77%. We have 23% of the, land, of the planets that's left, and that has most of the biodiversity, more even than the national parks. If we need to double food production in the next 30, 40 years, we can't double the amount of land we use. We've got to increase productivity without using more land. The biggest threat to the planet at this point is agricultural sprawl, not urban sprawl. And we've got to figure out how to do it smarter. One of the first responses of governments is to take land out of protection. A hundred countries in the last 25 years have taken land out of national parks and protected areas. That's not the solution. That's a way to rob biodiversity. But it's not just the land we've been changing, we've also been fundamentally changing the distribution of animals. If you just take mammals, for example, it's cattle, it's people, and all the way at the bottom are wild mammals. Less than 3% of the biomass on the planet. One little green dot at the bottom is all the elephant biomass on the planet. In fact, that's half today, because half of elephants have been killed in the last decade. So here's the math. You have 7 billion people, and they consume 1 billion one units of consumption each on average, you have seven billion units of consumption. That needs to fit on a planet. Today it doesn't, it's fitting on about 1.5 planets. By 2050, we're gonna have nine billion people at least, and they're gonna consume twice as much because they're gonna have 2.9 times as much income. They're gonna buy more and different kinds of food, including animal protein. So there's gonna be 18 billion units of consumption. How do we fit that on one planet? We're going to have to shrink each of those units of consumption, how many resources it takes to make it, how much land, how much water, how many inputs, by 65% to get it to fit. That's the challenge going forward. More with less. The speed of change on this planet is much faster than anybody's aware of. It took the UK with 9 million people 155 years to double GDP. It took the US with 10 million people just over 50 years to double GDP. With a billion people, it took China 12 years. With more than 800 million, it took India 17 years. So this is about 12 times the speed and 100 times the scale of what's happened in the past. And since China doubled its GDP, it's increased it 
one and a half times more since then. And India has doubled again since 2006. That's what's happening on the planet. When two billion people do things, it has an impact. When two billion people eat differently, it has an impact. And the first impact in, with China's development was price shocks on commodities. This shows the run-up to 2008, and then again in 2011 and 12. Every one of those yellow dots represents a food riot where somebody was killed. 25 food riots in the world. So one of the things that we need to realize is that trade is absolutely essential in the modern world. It fills the food gaps. Countries shouldn't be dependent on trade, but we need trade for when we have shortages. We need trade for when we have political uprisings. We need trade for when we have uh, natural disasters or when we have less rainfall. So here are some current food realities that I think we need to also take into account. Today we have 7.5 billion food experts. We have more food experts than we have experts on anything else in the world. Everybody knows what they like. And they're experts, they eat every day. Maybe not three times, but they eat every day. We also live in a world where social media, where your friends are more influential than science. There's a distrust of big food, globalization, of experts. But I think the one thing that is maybe the most important is that people with money don't go hungry. But a lot of other people do. So food is cheap, 800 million can't afford it. Over 100 million are stunted. That means whatever intellectual capacity they were born with, they will never achieve. The next Einstein, whoever. Half of the farm families, half of malnutrition on the planet is farm. Farmers can't afford to feed themselves and sell cash crops for the other things they need. We gotta freeze the footprint of food. We've got to figure out how to produce more with less. We've got to be more intensive in how we use resources, and we've got to be sustainable. So the challenge is, which systems can do this? Conventional, no-till, fair trade, organic, agroforestry? The point is, all of them have to do it. All of them have to double. We've got to figure out how to move entire global system. So how are we going to do it? I think there's four basic strategies. But the key here is not to look just at the strategies, but figure out what the results are that we want and let people find thousands of ways to get there. So I think the ways to get there are going to fall into four categories. Productivity and efficiency, so productivity around soil, around genetics, Efficiency around input use, like water, fertilizers, whether chemical or organic. Waste reduction and shifting consumption. It's basic. It's not rocket science. But here, I think the real, the real issue is that there isn't a blueprint here. It, there isn't a what to think. There's a how to think. And how to think more quickly. And how to build consensus more quickly. And how to develop pre-competitive strategies where we're working together. So one question is, on a finite planet, should we, should consumers, should people who eat have a choice about sustainable products? Or should every product available be sustainable? And why is it that the more sustainable products cost more when the less sustainable products actually cost the planet much more? Because we don't charge for externalities. We don't charge for the impacts of those less sustainable products. We need to change that. Waste. We waste one of three calories. Every country does it. Some is post-harvest loss, some of it's uh, the infrastructure, lack of refrigeration, etc. It's post-consumer, it's shrinkage in retail, it's all kinds of things. 
But if you look at it another way, we can consume two out of those three calories. We're going to need the equivalent of four calories going forward. If we reduce the waste, which is one of these three calories, then we're halfway to where we need to be by 2050, just by reducing waste. It is the low-hanging fruit. It's how we get more with less. Genetics. It's not a question of if genetics. It's a question of which genetics. And countries, societies are going to be different about this. But to adapt trees, varieties in 15 years to new diseases and new stresses and drought tolerance because of climate change is going to be essential. We're not going to do that with conventional plant breeding. We're going to need marker-assisted breeding. We're going to need other types of, of ways to address that issue. But instead of focusing on corn and soybeans and the traditional crops that get all of the attention, why don't we focus on the crops that are grown in the places where we're going to have the biggest population increases and where we're going to have the biggest increases in income? These are African crops. Why don't we focus on how to produce more of these crops, which is what people there eat? Instead of expanding production into new habitat, new grasslands, new forests, new wetlands, why don't we rehabilitate some of the land that's been farmed, degraded, and abandoned? It costs much less to do that than to clear forest. We know how to do this. Brazil has set very aggressive targets. About 15 million hectares have already been rehabilitated. A target is for another 30 million. Globally, we need to have a target of 250 million. It's a $10 billion rolling fund investment. It's not that much. We use one liter of water to produce one calorie of food today. That's an average. There's a lot that's better than that. But that average is important. We're going to need to change that so it takes half a liter to produce two calories. That's about where we need to get to. Many of us, myself included, have spent many, many years, decades even, trying to understand what best production looks like around the world, trying to encourage people to pay more for better products, better products that are certified against any number of different programs, and when the programs don't exist, create them. And what I've come to realize is the best are already better. The best are not the ones that are causing the problem. The problem's at the other end of the spectrum. The bottom 25% of producers of any commodity, I defy you to find me one where this is not the case, produce 50% of the impact and 10% of the product. So where are we going to get the most increase in productivity and the reduction of impacts? By working with the poorest producers, the ones that are doing the most damage. That's where we need to focus our attention. And that may be to do better, or it may be to get out and do something different. The biggest challenge, I think, at least in the first half of the 21st century, is going to be around animal protein. As countries get wealthier, the one thing they all do is eat more animal protein. They don't eat the same kind of animal protein, but they all eat more animal protein. And you can see in the data here the rise of poultry, pork, and beef. But if you look at the yellow line, that's the amount of land per person on the planet. 1.5, or excuse me, 0.15 hectares per person. So if we're going to eat meat, we're going to have to figure out how to do it with a lot fewer impacts than today. But you're not going to tell people not to eat meat. It's just not going to work. So we've got to figure out how to create awareness about the impacts, how to create alternatives, how to understand which kind of meat produced in which ways has which impacts that are acceptable, and how you're going to balance that in your life with something else. And there are some switches. The amount of consumption of, of beef in the US per capita has declined since 1970. Uh, the amount of land use, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions has reduced by 30% from beef uh, per calorie produced of beef. But just recently, total aquaculture production globally surpassed beef. 
So we're seeing switches now to seafood and to other sources of proteins. We just have to make sure that the aquaculture production is no worse than the beef production. In fact, hopefully much better. And then there's climate change. Climate change is affecting food production much faster than anybody thought. This is the impact of climate change projected on South Asia. Anything that is red or yellow is 5 to 25% less production of rice per hectare. That's virtually all of India, all of, of uh, Bangladesh, all of Thailand, all of Indonesia, most of China. Where's the food going to come from? This is why global trade is important. Other things will be produced there, but they won't be as efficient as rice, which is what people know how to produce. So with climate change, we have the double whammy of having lower productivity, but also farmers needing to switch and produce new crops that they don't know how to grow, or hanging on to the old crops when they're less efficient. And this is what climate change is doing to U.S. agriculture. In 2000, between, in Canada, between Saskatoon and Edmonton, they could grow four crops. Today, the growing season is three weeks longer, 15 years. They can grow 22 crops. China exported 6 million tons of pulses to India last year. Agriculture in the north is moving north. It's true of, of China as well, if you saw in the rice thing, where rice production is increasing, it's in Russia. It's in the stands. So this is what's happening to corn production in the US. By 2100, the corn belt will largely be in Canada. We're already seeing corn move north because it's too hot. It's being followed with sorghum. So sorghum is being produced now as the food crop, as the feed crop. But we're seeing this happen about 30 years faster than the modelers proposed it would. So these changes are moving much more quickly than anybody thought about. In the US, for most of our specialty crops, our fruits and vegetables and fruits, we depend on California. It's the single largest source. California became the dominant source for specialty crops starting about 100 years ago with transportation and refrigeration. Before that, we had a much more distributed system, and then it centralized in California. And because they could produce year-round, they had the advantage and could undercut a lot of the production, which was then lost in the Midwest and the East. Well, California is drier and hotter. And guess what? Within 15 years, they'll still be producing things, but now land, farmland in California is selling for up to a million dollars an acre if you can produce marijuana on it. Because they just passed a law that you can smoke marijuana in California now. So we're not going to be getting our fruits and vegetables from there. Where are we going to get them? Well, we think this is a likely spot. Got great water, good soils. The land is 20% of agricultural land in California. It's got the same amount of land already in production. And by the way, just about 100 miles to the west is the company that buys 20% and sells 20% of all the food in the US, Walmart. So we think we're going to see a bifurcation of the system. And we may see something further east on the east coast as well in Georgia. But we're going to see hubs of production that start springing up. So I'm from Missouri, and we have a saying that goes something like this. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. We know where we're going by 2050. It's already in the cards. We know where we are. The question is, how are we going to get there? And what are you going to do about it? Thank you very much. Thank you.